What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, and my name is John. And this week, we are back with episode 65, where we will be analyzing and predicting the UFC on ESPN3 card going down this Saturday night in Minneapolis, Minnesota, headlined by Francis Ngannou versus Junior Dos Santos. The prelims for this card will kick off at 6 p.m. Eastern Time with the main card starting at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a 13-fight card, and as of right now, the UFC website says that all 13 fights will be on ESPN. Now, I can't imagine that being true for uh, you know a Saturday night uh, ESPN showing uh, MMA for six or seven hours straight. It'll probably be split up amongst ESPN+, Plus, ESPN2, and ESPN+. But as of right now, it will be all going down on ESPN regular, the uh, TV channel. Towards the end of the program, we will quickly recap the UFC South Carolina card that went down this past weekend. But starting things off, we are going to get right into these 13 UFC fights going down in Minneapolis, Minnesota this weekend. So to start things off, we are going to be... In the heavyweight division, we got Maurice Green, who is seven and two, taking on Junior Albini, who is fourteen and five. The opening betting line for this one was Maurice Green, the favorite at minus one fifty-five, to Junior Albini, plus one fifty-five. Right now, we are seeing a pick 'em at minus one ten for both fighters. So more action coming in Albini's way. I'm going to disagree with the line movement. I think that Maurice Green um, should be the favorite in this fight. I think where the opening line was set is pretty accurate. You know, Albini has just looked so bad lately, losing three in a row. That decision, Arlovsky getting Ezekiel by Alexi Olenek. And then in his last fight against uh, Jairizo Rusenstruik, he, you know, had some early success in round one, took Jair down, couldn't really get a sub or keep him down. And then... Uh, in round two, just you know, looked gassed out, um, slowed down, and got finished with a, a combination of punches and kicks by uh, Rosen Struick in that one. So Albini has just you know looked really really hopeless lately. He uh, only has I believe one win in the UFC, and that was about two years ago over Tim Johnson. Um, so. Albini, uh, you know, can do some damage when he's in top position. That's what that's what how he finished uh, Tim Johnson. He did get um, Rosenstruik down uh, in that fight, but you know, Rosenstruik has no ground game, no takedown defense, and he still was able to get back up to his feet. So I imagine that if uh, Albini takes Maurice Green down, then Green will get back up to his feet easily. Green also has some pretty good uh, submissions off his back. He was able to. Uh, submit uh, one of his opponents in on the ultimate fighter finale i believe not too long ago let me find um miguel batista uh, or michelle but batista um you know back in november subbed him off his back with the triangle choke so i imagine green will be pretty comfortable if this fight goes to the floor he will either attempt a submission or get back to his feet and then once it's on the feet man i just don't think that albini will be able to close the range i think the uh, green will be using that jab that front kick he uh, made big improvements in his last fight from the ultimate fighter he you know started uh, using his range a little more he's you know a gigantic heavyweight uh, i believe six seven or something like that so you know he's starting to get some power behind his punches um he definitely still has some some holes on the feet he can get hit with a, a, a power punch of his own you know he got rocked by uh jeff hughes in his in the most recent fight but you know in his that that last fight against hughes you know for him to lose against hughes in lfa i think uh, it was a five round fight and then a year later he comes back and you know defeats Jeff Hughes via decision it just shows the improvements that he's making so I'm trusting Maurice Green in this spot and honestly at minus 110 I think that there's a bit of value uh, on Maurice Green next fight in the women's strawweight division we got Emily Whitmire who is four and two taking on Amanda Rebos who is six and one the opening betting line for this one was Emily Whitmire, the minus 305 favorite to Amanda Rebos, the plus 225 underdog. Right now, we are seeing Whitmire minus 170, Rebos plus 150. So more action coming in on the dog, Rebos, uh, a lot more action. And, you know, rightfully so. I think that Whitmire should be the favorite in this fight. Um, but, you know, just uh, minus 300 for Emily Whitmire is just a little bit uh, too much at this point. You know, Amanda Rebos coming off that long layoff has not fought since May of 2016. So, and uh, has not fought in the UFC. You know, she's been signed for a while, been scheduled uh, for a few fights, but they've all uh, fallen through. Now she's finally scheduled to make her UFC debut, uh, you know, three years after her most recent fight. So, 
uh, let's talk about Amanda Rebos when you know those her fights that she did have so um, she got hit with a jab early in her uh, last fight and then just desperately looked for the clinch you know uh, just right away was oh, grasping for the clinch she went for a head and arm throw it did not work and she ended up on her back um, you know she attempted an arm bar up off her back and she was in some bad bad positions you know she she was stuck on her back she couldn't get up and luckily the ref stood them up um, then after the the ref stood them up uh, Rebus hit a successful head and arm throw uh, and then round two hit another head and arm throw and then eventually uh, got the ground and pound finish uh, with the after the head and arm throw so it seems like the head and arm throw is a, a bread and butter submission or a bread and butter move for Rebus in her arsenal and that I'm not just you know making fun of her for it because it's such a low level technique. Uh, it's going to come into uh, into play in this fight. Um, also, uh, Amanda Ribas's only loss has come against uh, UFC fighter Poliana Viana. She was just uh, swarmed with punches and had no answer for uh, the strikes of Viana in that one and got finished. So uh, getting into uh, Emily Whitmire, also a woman looking much improved lately. She can, you know, keep fights standing if she wants to and, you know, try to keep fights at kickboxing range, use her kicks and uh, her jabs to win the, the striking of fights. And she also can take her opponents down and, and submit them, you know, in her most recent fight against uh Albu, uh, she uh, was able to take Albu down r relatively easily. Um, Albu uh, really had no idea how to, you know, get all back to her feet. And Emily Whitmire took her back easily and got the rear naked choke one minute and one second into their fight. So uh, Whitmire does have a very well-rounded game. She can she can beat Rebos in this fight on the feet, you know, just by being the more technical striker. And she can uh, take this fight to the floor and probably submit Rebos at some point. You know, Rebos just makes too many mistakes, you know, whether it'll be on the feet and the striking aspect of things or she'll go for a bad takedown, a desperate takedown in the clinch. Uh, and then I expected her to do that in this fight. You know, unless Re uh, Rebos has make it made huge improvements over the past three years of her being out of uh, out of action, I just don't see Rebos winning this fight. Uh, it's possible that Rebos has made those. Uh, you know, I just realized it. Um, she is Brazilian, so it's probably Hebos, not Rebos. But you know, we're too far into it at this point to go back and and correct our mistakes. So. Um, I expect Rebos to uh, make a mistake, uh, you know, probably in the uh, going for a takedown where Whitmire will capitalize on the position and uh, submit Amanda Rebos at some point. And you know, with that money coming in on uh, Amanda uh, Amanda Rebos as the dog, uh, Emily Whitmire at minus one seventy is getting to uh, you know a pretty uh, pretty comfortable play, honestly. Um, so I wouldn't totally knock a play on Whitmire at these odds. Personally, I'm going to stay away from it, but um, I'm picking uh, Whitmire to get the submission in this one. The next fight takes place in the light heavyweight division. We have Dolce Lungabula, who is 9-1, taking on Daquan Townsend, who is 21-8. The opening betting line for this one was Dolce minus 230, Townsend plus 170. Right now we are seeing Dolce minus 250, Townsend plus 190. So, uh... Sorry if I butched Mr. Dolch's last name. I know he's an avid listener of the Martian MMA podcast, but they in his uh, previous promotion they just called him uh, Dolch a champion because he was a you know a two division champion of their promotion, and they didn't they also struggle with the pronunciation of the last name. So this is a short notice replacement fight. Justin Ledet was supposed to fight uh, Dolch in this fight, but. Um, Ledette was uh, pulled from the fight a few days ago, and they got uh, Townsend in here as a replacement. So both of these guys, you know, uh, fair warning, are you know fairly low level guys. Uh, you know, Dolce, although he is a, was a double champion uh, in his previous organization, his skills do look uh, you know a little green at this point. So uh, in uh, one of his uh, fights at 205 uh, against an opponent with the last name of Allen, um, he was taken down and mounted in that fight and. Uh, you know, he spent four minutes on his back and was getting hit with some some big big ground and pound uh, by uh, Stuart Austin. I don't not Allen. I don't know why I said Allen. Uh, Stuart Austin was the gentleman's name. 
you know, the fight really could have been stopped. Uh, Dolce was taking a massive amount of punches uh, on the bottom uh, there, but, you know, the referee let it go. He let Dolce see the bell and recover, and in round two, Dolce came out and blitzed his opponent, uh, took him down, and then started hitting his opponent with some ground and pound, and then was able to get the finish. So a, a massive come-from-behind victory by Dolce in that fight. And in his most recent fight, against Andrew Van Ziel, uh, was a, uh, heavyweight, uh, opponent that he, uh, that he took on. That fight was a year ago. He has not fought in a year, but in that fight, he did go the full five rounds. He did fight an opponent who was a weight class bigger than him, and he fought in a pretty smart way. You know, he was taking his opponent down. He was laying in his guard, just, you know, doing the minimal amount you can to win the round. Um, you know, nothing against the guy, you know, he was fighting a, a dangerous heavyweight. He was just dumping him on his back and keeping him there. So, you know, no shame in that win. He uh, did what he had to do. He paced himself pretty well. It was a pretty low output affair. You know, there was not much intensity in the fight. It was, you know, kind of just like a sloppy grappling match with a little bit of striking. But, you know, re regardless, he got the win. He got the double championship. And he proved that he could go f uh, full five rounds with, a you know, a guy in a bigger weight class. So that's definitely a big uh, victory for him. Now getting over to Townsend, Daquan Townsend has a you know a lot of experience much more than uh than uh, Dolce has got almost 30 fights he's been paying his dues for a long time and his uh he's finally getting a chance in the octagon unfortunately his skills are, are not very good you know he on the feet uh he is very heavy on his feet he's a tall and lanky guy looking to throw you know power punches and just wing shots on the feet but um you know, he does have some submissions on his record. He does have some takedowns in his fight. He can catch a kick and put you on his back. But his real problem is the ground game. He cannot stop the takedown. He cannot get off his back. He's very, you know, awkward on the ground, does not move very well. He, uh, in his second most recent fight against a, a gentleman by the name of Portland Pringle. Uh, Portland Pringle was able to take him down relentlessly in that fight you know take his back and would just be in top position much more it was a back and forth slobby grappling fight and daquan townsend won on the judges scorecards but i had pringle portland pringle the third winning all three rounds of that fight so you know he he got screwed out of that decision but oh well uh also in uh Townsend's fight he's been rocked but with some uh, an overhand right and he's been uh, finished with some submissions before his opponent uh, Luka Strzosik uh, finished him with a heel hook after hurting him with an overhand right so he's got flaws you know everywhere uh, you know defensively on the feet he's not very technical when he's winging those shots on the feet he can't really stop a takedown he can't get off his back too well so um, you know he, there, there is a chance that uh, the Townsend can win this fight by you know catching Dolce with a punch on the feet but uh, outside of that, I really don't see how Townsend uh, can win this fight. You know, Dolce should be the better grappler. Uh, Dolce is the better athlete. He's probably in better shape, better cardio, more power. Uh, I just see Dolce either... Uh, you know, if he wants to come in here and, you know, uh, impress the UFC and uh, get in a firefight, uh, I, that's going to be risky. That's where he has the best chance of losing. But even in a firefight uh, on the feet, I expect uh, Dolce to come out on top and poss possibly knock out Townsend. But what I think Dolce will do is, you know, just look to dump Townsend on his back and keep him there. You know, be heavy on top, not let uh, Townsend out, not really look for submissions. That's not really Dolce's game. Just, you know, take his opponent down and... Uh, you know, lay and pray for the decision. Uh, that's probably the most likely outcome uh, is a is a decision, dominant decision via grappling for Dolce. Uh, but, you know, if these two gentlemen uh, decide to trade on the feet, you know, I expect one of them to hit the canvas. Um, so I'm favoring Dolce pretty heavily in this fight. Uh, minus 250 is, you know, a pretty uh, generous line. That line actually just came out, I think, today. So I expect that line to be steamed in the next couple of days and Dolce should close around minus 400. The next fight takes place in the lightweight division. We have Jared Gordon, who is 14 and 3, taking on Dan Moret, who is 13 and 5. The opening betting line for this one was Jared Gordon minus 275, Dan Moret plus 195. Right now we are seeing Gordon minus 325, Moret plus 265. I'm going to disagree with the line movement in this one. I think that 
uh, you know, even the, even the opening line, I think, could have been could have been set a bit closer. And where the line is at now, it's definitely a, a very wide. You know, Damn wretch, just not be this high of an underdog in this matchup. You know, Jared Gordon, you know, although he is the better fighter, he is the rightful favorite. Um, you just cannot trust him anywhere near minus 300. Even minus, you know, 250, I'd say, is the most you could cap Jared Gordon at. So, uh, you know, Jared Gordon uh, in his most recent fight against uh, Joaquim Silva, he was winning the fight. Uh, you know, on the judges' scorecards, he was winning the fight. However, I scored both rounds of that fight 10-10. Uh, you know, Jared Gordon was out striking um, Neto early in that fight uh, in the round one. Then Neto came back and rocked uh, rocked Jared Gordon, I think, with an overhand right and a flying knee at the end of the round. So, you know, Gordon was winning early, but, you know, Silva really had the most significant moment of the round with that, you know, that uh, combo at the end of the round. That's 10-10 in my opinion. And then... At that you know, Gordon was uh, starting to hit some takedowns. Was you know just out voluming Neto in round two, but then in, at the end of the round again, he he let it uh, you know took the last thirty seconds off. He got taken down himself, and Neto put him in a deep knee bar, and you could see uh, Gordon's face wincing. You know he was in pain. We saw that knee bar finish by uh, Zabit and by Aljamain Sterling last year. It's a very nasty submission. So you know that the fight was close to being finished there. Even though the judges might not have saw it, they might not. Not know knee bars as well as you know real fight fans but that fight was dangerously close to being stopped so again 10 10 round in my opinion so i had that fight 20 20 heading into the third and silva just had a little more left in the tank he had the momentum going his way he uh gordon had just you know hurt his knee uh from that knee bar and honestly, it never looked like Gordon really recovered from the uh, you know the the shots he was rocked with in the first round. And then uh, Joaquim Silva was able to swarm uh, Gordon with punches and to get the finish in round three from an inc- with an incredible come from behind victory. So uh, you know Gordon really dropped the ball in that one. He uh, he had the fight won. He had you know two rounds to zero on the judges' scorecards, but. You know the cardio gave out. He he was put in some bad spots. He you know didn't close the rounds well, and he paid the ultimate price with getting finished. Um, but other than that, you know Gordon's boxing has looked very good in the UFC. He can hit an offensive takedown. He can defend a takedown well. He did so versus Harkin Diaz when they fought. And uh, you know Dan Moret has also uh, you know looked uh, you know, I'd say decent in the UFC so far. He came in on short notice and got knocked out by Gilbert Burns. No shame in that loss. And then had a very competitive uh, back and forth fight with Alex White in his last fight. Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, desperately pursuing the takedown in that fight. Uh, you know, there was a lot of time in the clinch in that fight. And, he, uh, you know, Moret was able to get White down at sometimes. He had some good ground and pound. But, you know, ultimately, um, you know, White just outgrinded him. Moret was, uh, you know, constantly looking for that takedown. But he, he really didn't um, really didn't have the control, the top control, uh, to keep Alex White down. And, you know, Alex White ended up taking him down later in that fight, too. So, um, you know, Moret was just really tired in, in that later in that fight. He was just, you know, kind of clinging on to the knees, uh, looking for a takedown. It was really just a stalemate type of fight towards the end of it. And White just outgrinded him. So I think both of these guys kind of have uh, cardio issues. Especially when they wrestle, you know, when both of these guys are wrestling for the first two rounds, you know, they're 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 huffing and puffing in round three big time. So uh, I expect Moret to try to close the distance in this one and try to get Gordon down. I don't think he will though. I think Gordon has good enough uh, defensive wrestling to you know keep Moret off him. I think he has good enough striking to uh, keep Moret away from him or you know circle around the cage. So I do favor Gordon. I think the Gordon will stuff the takedowns. I think Gordon can even be the one hitting his own offensive takedowns and winning this fight via top position that way but uh you know with gordon's uh you know possibly his durability issues you know with his chin his cardio issues um i I don't think you can trust him at where the current price is and at where the current price is i think it's honestly worth a little bit of a stab at dan Barrett. you know you can get him at plus 285 on bet dsi right now so uh the value is on moret in this one but i'm picking gordon to win the matchup uh probably by decision The next fight takes place in the featherweight division. We have Jordan Griffin, who is 17 and 6, taking on Vince Murdoch, who is 12 and 3. 
the opening betting line for this one was Jordan Griffin minus 265, Vince Murdoch plus 185. And right now we are seeing Jordan Griffin minus 380 to Vince Murdoch plus 315. So more action coming in on Jordan Griffin's way. And uh, I agree with where the initial line mo- line was set, but you know where the where the line has gone since I think it's a little too steep. Um, I think that uh, you know Jordan Gr- Griffin, although losing his his debut, uh, he was uh, you know very impressive in that fight. He was able to scram- scramble to top position and avoid the uh, the, t- the submissions and the, the top control of Dan Ige, who is just you know a tremendous fighter. We saw him uh, fight last weekend with just uh, you know a, a great performance, getting the win over Kevin Aguilar, and uh, you know Griffin hung in there with him. He uh, you know was uh, I'd say a step behind all fight, but you know Griffin scrambled out of some tough positions. He uh, escaped some submissions. He was in some bad spots at some times, and Griffin was constantly able to get out of there um so you know griffin's uh you know his scramble game was really really impressive uh less uh fight so uh getting over it to his opponent vince murdoch is making his ufc debut in this one not very much uh footage of uh, murdoch uh, unfortunately it was uh, very hard to find uh, some of his fights and because of that i really don't have a good understanding of his grappling you know i i in his fights, I have not seen him defend takedowns. I've not seen him go. I've seen him go for his own offensive takedowns, um, but I, you know, I have not seen him defend takedowns against you know a good grappler, escape submissions. So a lot of this fight is very unknown. So uh, I expect the the fight to be close while it's on the feet. You know, it should be a close striking fight. Uh, Griffin really didn't get to show too much of his striking in his last fight uh, against Ige because it was just so much in uh, scrambling but honestly Griffin what what Griffin showed uh, he looked pretty good uh, he had a, a very nice left head kick that he was throwing a lot in that fight and uh, you know I watched uh, one of Murdoch's fights uh, and he fought a gentleman named Andrew Ventimid Ventimigila and uh, Ventimigila landed, uh, you know, a nice left head kick on Vince Murdoch in that fight. And you know, uh, I saw that, and right away, you know, I thought of the left head kick of jo- jo- Jordan Griffin. That could be a, a tool that Griffin is going to, uh, you know, attack in this one. So, um, you know, Vince Murdoch, he uh, he's had s- some weird fights recently too. Fighting over uh, in the uh, SFL is a super fight league. It's an Indian promotion, and he you know had uh, s- some weird uh, weird stuff go on. You know, he had one of his fights get stopped from a cut behind his ear. He had a fight get stopped because of uh, faking a groin strike. You know, he got kicked in the leg, and he acted like it was a groin strike, and the fight was ruled a. Uh, a TKO for his opponent, you know, a lot of fishy stuff going on, but he did uh, pick up a victory over uh, Justin King, uh, just swarming him with punches and knees, uh, finishing him in that fight, so, you know, Vince Murdoch, hard to get a, hard to get a good idea of, of the guy, he trains at Team Alpha Male, but there's just very little footage of him online, um, so, you know, I'm going to side with the favorite in Griffin, uh, just because he's, you know, been in the UFC, he's looked uh, good in his one fight, despite it being a loss, so, you know, Murdoch could come in here and, you know, really impress us and get the victory here. Uh, you know, where the betting line is at, I honestly think that there, it's it's 100% dog or pass. You know, uh, you know Vince Murdoch at plus 315 is, is, you know, pretty good value, honestly. You just can't be trusting Jordan Griffin at minus 400 when he doesn't have a win in the UFC. And he's fighting an opponent who is, you know, pretty unknown. Uh, he trains at a legit camp. He has some, you know, some decent skills in there. So you really can't count Murdoch out. So I'm not going to count him out. I don't think it's a totally, you know, win, uh, unwinnable fight for him. But I'm going to side with Griffin to get the victory. The next fight takes place in the light heavyweight division. We have Vincius Moreira, who is 9-2, and two, taking on Eric Anders, who is 11-4. and four. The opening betting line for this one was Anders minus 245, Marrera plus 175. Right now, we are seeing Anders minus 345, Marrera plus 285. So, you know, right off the bat, I just think that Anders at minus 350 is just ridiculous. You know, uh, he has looked worse and worse lately. Uh, you know, his he, three fights and losing three fights in a row. You know that the, his last victory was over Tim Williams, a, a lower level opponent, and in his last fight against Khalil Roundtree, he took an absolute thrashing in that fight, and that fight was only in April fourteenth, 
you know, that was two and a half months ago. And now he, he got his leg smashed in that fight. He got his leg kicked nonstop. He got dropped four times in that fight. Just took an insane amount of damage. And he's back in here, uh, you know, 10 weeks later with this fight. It's it's not a good sign, you know. The Eric Anders could not have made many improvements uh, in that amount of time. He, you know, um, shit, I don't even know if he can recover in that amount of time from taking four knockdowns from Khalil Roundtree. Uh, you know, your, your head needs a little more time to clear than two and a half months before you get back in there. Uh, and luckily for Anders, he's fighting... Uh, a very low-level opponent in Vincius Moreira. Uh, Moreira is, you know, sub or bust, man. He, uh, all of his wins have come by uh, submission. I don't know, he has one TKO victory. S sub or bust, man. He has no striking. Uh, his takedowns aren't very good. He's, you know, just a desperate submission type of guy. He did uh, pick up a submission on the uh, Tuesday Night Contender Series over John Allen. But even that, that fight was, you know, a sloppy grappling fight and eventually... Uh, you know, Marrera did uh, tap uh, Allen out with like an arm bar or a triangle or something, but it, it, it was sloppy. Uh, and in his UFC debut, uh, you know, he started slow. He got a kick caught. He got put on his back. Um, he, he looked, uh, you know, very predictable in there. His, you could see his strikes were coming from a mile away, especially his kicks. You know, he just totally winds up on, with them. Uh, he was getting outstruck very, uh, you know, very, very clearly by a uh, Alonzo Menafield, he and then Moreira was just throwing, you know, b terrible spinning back kicks. You know, he threw a spinning back kick and just got absolutely smashed with a right hand counter punch by uh, Menafield in that fight. Just terrible fight IQ, no footwork, no striking, uh, can't set up a takedown, uh, and even when he gets to the fight to the floor, he. Uh, He's not really like an elite type of grappler. I, if this fight ends up on the floor, I think the Anders will uh, 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 be able to avoid the submission. Uh, you know, he was able to avoid the submission of uh, Marcus Perez, who is, you know, a much better grappler, a much better mixed martial artist uh, than Marrera. So, you know, I could, you know, it's possible, of course, that, that Marrera could pull off some uh, some fluke sub or something like that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't I just don't see how Anders loses this fight, despite all I was saying about Anders, you know, coming back too soon and him taking all that damage last fight. Just Marrera doesn't have the IQ. He doesn't have the skills um, to, to really come out here and beat Anders. So uh, I expect Anders to, you know, outstrike Marrera on the feet to uh, avoid the takedown. Uh, if the fight ends up on the floor, you know, if Marrera pulls guard, then I think An Anders will avoid the uh, the submission and either win with, you know, uh, top control on the ground, win by outstriking Marrera, or possibly even knocking Marrera out, even though Anders does not have much uh, knockout power. You know, just Marrera's defense is so bad and he puts himself in bad spots. Uh, I would not be totally surprised to see uh, Anders knock him out in this spot. So the pick is going to be Anders, but you know where the line is at now, it's it's too too steep. I don't think it's quite you know steep enough to where there's value on Marrera. I really don't give Marrera a good chance in this fight at all. Um, so the pick is going to be Eric Anders. The next fight takes place in the bantamweight division. We have. Ricardo Hamos, who is 12 and 2, taking on Journey Newson, who is 9 and 1. The opening betting line for this one was Hamos minus 305, Newson plus 225. Right now we are seeing Hamos minus 335, Newson plus 275. So even more action coming in on the big favorite Ricardo Hamos in this one. Um, so um, similar to Murdoch earlier on the card. Uh, Newsom was very hard to find tape on. Uh, you know he's fought lower level competition. Uh, he only has two full fights available on the internet, uh, and you know I scoured scoured the net for him. You know there's some clips of him. You know uh, his you know finishing combinations. You know knocking some people out, and he looks good in those. But those are highlights. You know you really can't take much from those. He looks you know like a very muscular. You know looks big dude for uh, 135 pounds, and it looks like he has some real power behind his punches. And in his most recent uh, victory. Victory over uh, Soslan Abukhanov. He, he floored Abukhanov in that fight. You know, you can you can find that um, that knockout on YouTube. You know, just a quick 15 second clip. Not even the whole fight, even though it's only 80 seconds long. But you know, his nuisance striking looked crisp in that that little clip. But like I said, can't take much from that. 
uh, in his, uh, you know, few fights that I was able to watch, he, uh, he was, uh, taken down off of, uh, you know, a lazy kick, uh, he can hit his own offensive takedowns, he, he can't stuff a takedown when, when you are, you know, shooting in on him, and, you know, I just got a, you know, a decent, uh, well-rounded vibe from him you know he looks like he can uh, stuff a takedown he looks like he can hit, he can hit an offensive takedown there's some footage of him uh, competing in jiu-jitsu competitions you know seven or eight years ago so he's been doing doing jiu-jitsu for you know uh, the better half of a decade so I imagine the guy can grapple and his striking has looked pretty good from the limited footage I've seen of him so Getting over to Hamos, uh, he, uh, he came up short in his last fight, getting knocked out by that spinning back kick uh, by Saeed Nurmagomedov. Really struggled with the range of Nurmagomedov in that fight, and just the kicks, you know, Nurmagomedov was throwing those spinning kicks all f from the start of that fight, and eventually found a home for one, hitting um, Hamos in the body, and then uh, Nurmagomedov followed up with some uh, ground and pound for the finish. But, um... Hamos also looks very well-rounded, you know, has uh, good boxing, very fast hands. Um, he can, uh, you know, similar to Newsom, you know, he has gotten his kicks caught before and then dumped on his back. Um, but, you know, he, he can uh, get back up to his feet. You know, he, he th he'll he threaten with a submission and, you know, uh, get back on top. That's what he did with Kyoho Kyung. He uh, was taken down off of a, a, a kick and then he threatened with a knee bar and got back on top position. So, uh, you know, Hamos, very well rounded. Uh, he uh, has, you know, his striking looks very crisp. He's got a good technique on the feet. Uh, I do think he should be the favorite in this one just because he's tested. He, We've seen him in the UFC. We've seen him beat good guys in the UFC, actually. Uh, and, you know, we have not, we cannot say the same for uh, Newsom at all. So, you know, Newsom, you know, has looked good o over the lower level competition that he's beat. Um, but, you know, there's just not, not enough footage on the guy to get a, you know, a really solid read on him. With that being said, though, uh, you know, Hamos coming off of, uh, you know, losing his last fight uh, via finish, um, you know, him not being the most, you know, uh, impressive guy on the roster, you know, for, uh, for Newsom coming in here at plus 275, you know, it's a, uh, it's pretty wide, honestly, we were seeing a lot of this lately where, uh, you know, these guys on the car, uh, it, mostly on this card where there's a lot of, you know, minus 300 favorites for guys who really don't deserve to be minus 300. Um, so, uh, the value on this one, I'd say is on Newsom at plus 275, but I expect Hamos to, uh, get the victory via decision, uh, mostly just by outboxing, um, Newsom in this one. But if Newsom does win this fight, uh, you know, I, I see by being by the, you know, the power, he looks like he has a big power discrepancy, it looks like he'll be the bigger, stronger guy in there. And you know, I can see him touching that chin of uh, Hamos along the way. So um, that's that, that for that fight. And uh, we are going to move on to the main card where we have uh, a fight in the light heavyweight division. Paul Craig, who is 11 and 3, taking on Alonzo Menafield, who is 8 and 0. The opening betting line for this one was Menafield minus 265, Craig plus 185. Right now we are seeing Menafield minus 300, Craig plus 250. So more action coming in on the favorite Menafield. I agree with the line move in this one. You know, I just said that we are seeing a lot of guys that are minus 300 that don't really deserve to be, but I think Menafield does deserve to be in this spot. But he is fighting the Bear Jew, Paul Gregg, and, you know, you can never count the Bear Jew out. Uh, this guy can take a beating, and he'll still be there. He'll still be looking for takedowns, looking for submissions. And, you know, it, it could be a bit of a meme at this point because he has done this twice. He has lost, you know, convincingly to uh, Kennedy Nechwenko and to uh, Magomed Ankalaev, and he, he subbed both of them with a triangle in round three in the last minute of the fight after losing the first 14 minutes. So it just shows you the heart of Paul Craig, the fact that he won't quit, the fact that he, you know, he's comfortable being on bottom. He's comfortable getting his ass kicked, taking some elbows to the head, you know, bleeding a little bit because he, he's still going to be there, still going to be looking for that submission. And he's, you know, got very, very nice chokes. You know, he can set up a triangle well. Uh, you know, he did it... Uh, very well against Nechwenko, but Nechwenko's ground game is, is very bad. So that wasn't as impressive. The, the Ankalaev one was impressive because Ankalaev's ground game is great, and Craig was still able to pull off the triangle on that one. But uh, Menafield, well, he's 1-0 in the UFC so far. 
He uh, ran through Marrera, like we mentioned earlier in his last fight. He just start, he starts fast, man. He, he runs across the cage, and he blitzes you and starts throwing punches right away. And on the feet, he's got real nice uh, boxing. You know, not the not the best boxing, not the, you know, the best defense. But he's got, you know, nice straight punches, got some power behind him. Um, you know, and uh, but when he can get in, you know, wild exchanges, he, he does not have good defense. And, uh, you know, he, he blitzed one of his opponents, uh, Lacerda, in, uh, in his, one of his LFA fights. And they started trading against the cage right away. And uh, for a, a quick moment, Menafield was definitely rocked by a punch in that fight. But uh, he he can uh, he's good at catching kicks and dumping you to your back and then smashing you with ground and pound. That's how he uh, picked up the win on the Tuesday Night Contender Series over Deshaun Boatwright, getting that contract. He's got heavy ground and pound once he gets you on the ground. And uh, you know, taking catching kicks is not his only way of getting you on his back. He can hit offensive takedowns. He'll you know double leg you or suplex you down to the the, the mat. Um, so Menafield, uh, it looks like a bit of a powerhouse. He looks like, uh, you know, a little unpolished, definitely. And, uh, you know, he, I think he should come out here and, you know, probably get Craig out of there in the early rounds or either round one or round two um, just by, you know, rocking Craig with a punch on the feet and finishing up with some ground and pound or looking for that takedown on Craig. Well, Craig, you know, is going to be looking for the takedown himself. You know, he's always uh, going for the takedown. He's always, you know, trying to pull guard, get the fight to the floor any way possible. So, you know, Menafield can can kind of play into that. You know, if Craig pulls guard, you know, Menafield will, will – will just smash him with ground and pound from there on he does have to be sub- careful of the submissions he you know of course can be submitted but you know Marrera uh is a black belt despite him you know me talking shit on him earlier saying that he's you know not a good fighter um you know Marrera didn't come close to submitting Menafield really so uh, I don't see Craig you know doing the same but you know you can never call- count Craig out and the later this fight goes the better chances Craig has you know because he's still going to be there he has the better cardio of the two he has those come from behind late victories with the submissions and you know Menafield uh, I don't think he has much experience in the later rounds you know I could be wrong but I imagine that most of his uh, finishes are yep has uh, only been out of round one once in his career and you know uh, actually twice he but then he finished both of those opponents in round two so you know he's really untested past the six minute mark in his career so uh, it'll be interesting uh the way to play this fight i think would be to uh maybe you know live bet or excuse me pre-fight bet menafield uh straight or pre-fight uh pre-bet uh menafield you know inside the distance or minus 3.5 and then if craig is still standing after round one then look to live bet paul craig if he's still standing after round two look to live bet paul craig even pre-fight you can you know put some stabs on craig round two craig round three um, because the if this fight goes later you know car, menafield's cardio has never been tested before and he could uh you know give out on us and get finished himself losing his undefeated record so like, like i said you can never c- count the the bear jew paul craig out he's always dangerous he can take a beating and still submit you um but i'm i'm favoring alonzo menafield to get to uh, you know put that beating on him and you know get that finish uh craig has been finished before he has been dominated by guys on the ground like uh, jimmy crute who is not really too much of a ground specialist he was just uh you know in the right positions at the right time had good positional grappling and uh ended up on top and eventually submitted paul craig in that fight so uh, I'm going to pick uh, Alonzo Menafield to get the TKO in round one of this one. Next fight in the lightweight division, we have Drew Dober, who is 20 and 9, taking on Marco Pollo Reyes, who is 8 and 5. The opening betting line for this one was Dober minus 350, Pollo Reyes plus 250. Right now, we are seeing Dober minus 335, Pollo Reyes plus 275. So, uh, you know, the books are opening up Dober as that big favorite. And um, I, I think I would agree, honestly. Uh, you know, Pollo Reyes has really struggled lately. He, uh, you know, got finished in his last fight by Demir Hodzovic. And, you know, it wasn't like he got dropped and finished uh, in a, a striking battle like he did versus Vic. You know, he was just outclassed on the feet and on the ground in that fight. He was outboxed by Hodzovic early. And then he was just taken down uh, in the first round. 
and eventually taking down in the second round and mounted and finished with some ground to pound just cannot escape that top position of Hodzovich and you know Hodzovich isn't really known as a grappler um, so you know is a, a little bit of a, a worrisome loss that he lost to uh, you know a dominant uh, grappling loss to a guy who's not really a grappler so uh, the, the weakness of Pollo Reyes is definitely the ground game what he wants to do is you know uh, have that Mexican style boxing where he just wants to come in here and uh, trade punches on the feet and he has won some fights that way you know the most memorable one being uh, Matt Frivola he just went out there and you know he, he steamrolled the the frivola um in that one so uh getting down to this matchup i think that uh dober uh comes out very aggressive he's got good boxing he's got a nice left hand he's he's got that uh good southpaw stance he can throw a good outside leg kick but you know his boxing defense is not is not the best uh he he can definitely get hit with some punches on the feet so that's where reyes can win this fight if they are trading on the feet getting in some uh some firefight like exchanges Reyes can touch that chin to Dober and possibly put him out, but I don't think he will do so. I think that Dober can, will win the striking exchanges on the feet. Uh, I think he'll be using that leg kick and that long straight left hand to, you know, outstrike Reyes at range, you know, circling to stay away, to not get in the pocket. And then if Dober really wants to, I think that he will uh, take Reyes down. Uh, you know, Dober has had some problems in the in the grappling department of his own, but those are only against like high level grapplers. You know, Benil Daryush, uh, he he made some mistakes on the ground. He went for a guillotine. He ended up on his back, and then he ended up getting submitted himself with an armbar in round two of that fight after he was winning. So, um, I I think that Dober will uh, either outstrike Poyo Reyes on the feet at range in this one or he will look in to uh, look to mix up the offensive takedowns and stay in top position Dober has done that to a number of his opponents before he's done it to guys at 170 so you know uh, he's back down to 155 in this fight he cuts an insane amount of weight you know we've heard stories of Drew Dober cutting down to from 186 to 156 in one week. You know, 30 pounds in six days is uh, what George Lockhart cut him down. So, you know, Dober, that cardio cannot be good uh, in rounds two and three. His chin cannot be good, you know, getting sucked down that 30 pounds. So hopefully Dober's dieting a little better. Hopefully he's got that weight cut under control. But, you know, you, you can never really trust Dober at, the, at this steep of a price, you know, minus 350 because of the unknowns you know of that um you know that bad boxing defense you know the bad ground awareness and you know that that question of the cardio being bad at 155 the chin being a little depleted and you know him just winning that last fight against Daryush and then letting it slip away making those mistakes on the ground and losing that fight via submission it was a, a bad performance from from Dober so both these guys coming off of uh, losses um, and uh, I expect uh, this one to be a good fight. You know, if, if it's on the feet, I expect it to be close. Reyes has a chance to win it on the feet, but I think Dober will mix in the takedowns and he will uh, win the fight via decision. Could even finish Reyes on the on the ground if he gets top. Uh, you know, if he gets mount or a very uh, dominant top position. Next fight, also in the lightweight division, we got Vince Peichel, who is eleven and two, taking on Roosevelt Roberts, who is undefeated at eight and zero. Right now, we are seeing the opening betting line. Roberts, minus 215. Vince Peichel, plus 165. And currently, we see Roberts, minus 265. Peichel, plus 225. So more action coming in on the favorite Roosevelt Roberts way. And, uh, you know, rightfully so. I think that, uh, you know, we're dealing with a legitimate prospect on our hands in Roosevelt Roberts here. He's a very, uh, you know, tall, long guy. He's got, you know, quick, powerful hands. He has, you know, good... Um, outburst of offense in the feet where he's waiting 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 and then he'll explode with that three four punch strike combination he's got good distance management he looks for you know very confident in his, uh, his striking and that's very impressive considering that he's you know mostly a grappler he's uh, most of his wins are by the way of submission uh in his ufc debut he got that that memorable guillotine over daryl horcher and, uh, you know, he won his last fight against Thomas Gifford by just, you know, dominant uh, grappling in that one. So, uh, you know, Roosevelt Roberts is a very well-rounded guy. Uh, he, uh, I've been impressed with him so far. Um, you know, the, the only sh you know, real sign of weakness is he sh that he's shown is that Thomas Gifford fight. He, he wasn't too aggressive. He wasn't really chasing the finish in that one. Um, and he actually got taken down in, in round three. 
uh, versus Gifford in that fight. Man, you know, he wasn't in any danger. He did get back up to his feet. He still, I think, probably won the round. But, uh, you know, he, he looked like he, he took a little bit of time off in round round three there. He's not going to be uh, looking to do that here because he's fighting a much more legit opponent in uh, Vince Peichel. Um you know, I think that the people aren't really respecting Peichel in this one. He's uh, people forget that the the dude's got four UFC victories, got some nice victories too. You know, Damian Brown, uh, Joaquim Silva, Anthony Anjouani. Uh, so uh, I think people are really just underrate or underestimating him because he lost that last fight so dominantly to Gregor Gillespie. But Gregor Gillespie is you know an absolute fucking beast, man. This dude is you know. Uh, uh, a world-class wrestler, you know, one of the best wrestlers in, in UFC history, honestly, and uh, it's no wonder that Paito was a step behind, and, you know, Paito did defend well, you know, he got back up to his feet a couple of times, and he got dragged back down, um, but, you know, he, he, he hung in there for a while, he he had no quitting him, even though he did eventually get arm triangled about nine minutes into the fight, but he uh, he showed some heart in that fight. And, you know, even though Pincho, uh, Pincho was uh, outgrappled in that fight, he still will be able to outgrapple a lot of guys in the lightweight division. He has great wrestling base himself. He can hit good offensive takedowns. He's got some good striking. He's got some power in his hands. He counterpunched Damian Brown and, you know, knocked him out with that right hand coming off of that long layoff. So, um, Pincho, uh, you know, he came off that layoff. He got that knockout. And then he, uh, you know, lost to... Uh, Gillespie in that last fight so uh, like I said I think people are underestimating a little bit so uh, where the line is at now uh, it's it's I'd say it's dog or pass I don't think you can trust Roberts at this uh, steep of a price I think that this one will be close honestly I think that uh, uh, you know I think if this fight stays in the feet that Roberts should be able to outstrike Peichel he'll be using those long straight punches and his kicks uh, and his range to keep Peichel uh, at distance and outstriking him that way it'll be really interesting to see who initiates the ground the the ground fighting in this one so if Peichel is the one shooting for the takedown then I could see him getting Roberts down and you know uh you know I think Roberts should be able to get back up to his feet I think Roberts should be able to threaten with the takedown but it'll get real interesting if Peichel is able to put Roberts on his back um you know because Peichel has you know a, a very very uh good ground game and i think that he could possibly avoid the submission of roberts if he's able to put him on his back but uh you know and uh, if roberts is looking to uh be the one to uh, initiate the uh offensive grappling in this one it, again it could get interesting i think Paicho could stuff the shots i think he could keep it on the feet and look to make it a closer fight so it's definitely dog or pass where it's at now uh, I think that uh, that you the Roberts should win the fight. I think that he is a little bit better than Pichol everywhere, but it does not mean Pichol can win this fight. He can stuff takedowns. He can hit takedowns and start to outstrike uh, Roberts. He can get top position on the ground and win rounds that way. So it's a close fight. I think it's a little closer than the odds are, are saying right now. I'm going to side with uh, with Roberts in this one, but uh, it's, it's dog or pass where it's at now. Next fight takes place in the welterweight division. We have Damian Maya, who is 26 and 9, taking on Anthony Rocco Martin, who is 16 and 4. The opening betting line for this one was Maya minus 195, Martin plus 155. Right now, we are seeing Maya minus 170, Rocco Martin plus 150. So Damian Maya needs no introduction. One of the greatest jiu-jitsu uh, practitioners in UFC history. You know what he's coming in here to do. He's looking to put you, put your back against the fence, shoot in for a takedown, get you down on the ground, and then tap you out from there. And that's exactly what he did to Lyman Good. He backed him right up to the cage, shot a single leg, got Good down, and when Good tried getting back up to his feet, you know Maya hopped on his back and got that rear naked choke. So, uh, you know Maya's striking has never been that great. His uh, his takedown setups have never been that great, but he still has a way of you know getting you to the ground. He he uh, will pull guard or he'll set up a shot somehow, snatch a single leg, and he will uh, probably choke you out if he gets a hold of you. So the things to worry about Maya are is, you know, his cardio uh, and his age. You know, he uh, has gassed out in fights. You know, the, the Colby Covington fight comes to mind. Um, you know, his cardio didn't look too good versus Usman, although that was a little short notice. But and he's getting up there in age, man. Damian Maya's 41 years old. He's not coming. He's not sniffing another another title shot. You really got to question what the motivation for Damian Maya is. You know, he his if you're thinking that he's looking to retire after this last fight, he just won a fight in Brazil and he tapped the guy out in the first round. If he was looking to retire.
retired, that's the fight to retire after a first round submission in your home country of Brazil. Now you're taking a tough fight in Minneapolis against uh, Rocco Martin. It's, uh, you know, Amaya's taking this fight. He's not looking for an easy fight. He's not looking to come in here and win and retire. You know, he's still, uh, you know, game taking on uh, very good opponents in Rocco Martin. So getting over to Martin, you know, uh, former lightweight, moved up to 170. It's just looked like a, a new fighter since he moved up to 170. I think he's undefeated since he since he moved up. And, uh, you know, he was getting, he was losing to guys, uh, to grapplers like uh, Oben, uh, Oliver Oben Mercier at, at um lightweight he got choked out by uh leo santos got choked out by Daryush. so he has lost by submission to a few guys before but th those were all at uh, 55 man and he like i said he's a totally different fighter at 170 he's finishing guys at 70 he's taking guys to decision and you really gotta look at his last fight because it's against sergio marias and marias is you know a third degree black belt he's you know competed and won golds at the 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 black belt level so he's, you know, pretty much as good as it gets for, you know, jujitsu grappling. I think the Damian Maya's MMA grappling and overall grappling is a, a tad better, but Marias had really very little success in the grappling versus uh, Rocco Martin. He was able to snatch uh, an ankle pick and single leg or something like that and get Rocco Martin down to the ground in the first minute of the fight, but Martin quickly reversed position. He ended up on top, and the fight really didn't touch the canvas from then on out. Uh, Martin just outstruck Marias easily was uh you know jabbing him hitting that calf kick and uh was uh, his striking has looked great and you know martin has got jujitsu of his own he's got a you know black belt himself he uh can you know get off get off the ground when he gets taken down he can threaten with a, a submission he can hit his own submissions so uh you know martin is a very well-rounded fighter i think he's actually the better well-rounded fighter of the two he's certainly the more athletic the quicker the more powerful fighter at this point in his career too but that doesn't that doesn't mean he's going to win this fight um so you know if if maya is able to i mean if marias was able to get martin down in in the first round of their fight you got to think that maya is going to be able to too it just really comes down to if martin is able to smartly defend the early grappling onslaught of maya and if martin is still standing after round one i think that he wins this fight i think it's going to be maya round uh submission or, or bust i really i don't see maya having the cardio to take uh, martin down and keep top position for uh two rounds to win the decision if this fight gets to round three, man, I really favor it for Martin. I think Martin could possibly finish Maya in round three. Martin has, you know, really good round threes. He's finished uh, uh, Jake Matthews. He finished Ryan LaFlair in both in round three. His cardio has looked so, so much better at 170. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of guys are kind of counting Martin out. They're saying that he lost to uh, by submission. He got out grappled by OAM and Santos and Darius. And they're thinking Maya's going to do the same. But that, that was a different, that was Anthony. Anthony Martin. That was Anthony Martin at 155, and well, now we're we got Rocco Martin at 170. He's a totally different fighter, and you know I've really enjoyed watching Martin fight lately, and uh, I'm gonna pick him to win this fight. And coming in, I think with the first underdog that I'm picking uh, to win the fight. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, Martin will get taken down. I think that he will remain solid defensively, and I think he'll end up getting back to his feet. Uh, you know, he can make some dumb mistakes in the cage. He can have some low IQ moments like fighting Jake Matthews. You know, he got, was edging Jake Matthews on, you know, trying to get in, you know, a stand and bang exchange in the feet, and then he got dropped. You know, so uh, Martin can make mistakes. He can certainly get his back taken and get choked out in this fight. But uh, I'm favoring uh, Martin to get up from the early takedowns and start out striking my in the later rounds possibly getting a finish but i'm gonna go with martin to win a 29 28 decision next fight it takes place in the flyweight division we got Juicier formiga who is 23 and 5 taking on joseph benavidez who is 27 and 5 the opening betting line for this one was Benavidez minus 165, Formiga plus 125. Right now, Benavidez still minus 165, Formiga plus 145. So there's two way action coming in on this fight. You know, all action coming in both ways of these guys. And, you know, what a, what a close, excellent fight this is. You know, these guys are 
two of you know the last flyweights on the roster, two of the most uh, you know uh, consistent guys, uh, you know perennial contenders at flyweight for the past five years. For me, gonna never get that title shot. Benavides come, came up short a few times against DJ, but you know these guys are easily two of the best flyweights in in MMA history. So it's a pleasure to get them uh, to see them matched up at this point in their career. They did get matched up a little bit earlier about four or five years ago and Benavidez won that fight you know clearly he was you know blitzing Formiga just out volume in with the striking early and then JB uh you know rocked him with a left cross followed by a right hook and then swarmed him with some knees and some ground and pound and finished uh, Formiga in round one of that fight. So Benavidez was just, you know, the better fighter at that point in time. But since then, I think that Formiga has has gotten better of the two. You know, Formiga's striking has gotten a lot better. His, you know, his boxing has improved. His his ground game, you know, has always been phenomenal. But it's really at its, its highest level now. And you saw that in the Figueroa fight. Taking down Figueroa, neutralizing them there, you know, keeping them on the ground, stringing together takedowns, you know, heavy top position. Um, you know, Formiga is really just a, a tremendous fighter. Um, the only guys who have really been able to beat Formiga lately have been uh, Henry Cejudo, the champion, who was just, you know, basically stopping Formiga's uh, takedowns. It was, that fight played out mostly in the clinch. Um, you know, same with Ray Borg. That fight was mostly in the clinch. Ray Borg was able to just stuff Formiga's takedowns and keep the fight standing. Um, and when the fight is standing, you know, Formiga doesn't really do his best work. He really has to be grappling to 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 win the fight. And I think that that's how this fight will go. If if Formiga is not able to grapple, I don't think that he can win this fight. I think that Joe B uh, is still the better striker of the two. Um, Although I think the striking will be much more competitive than the first time they fought because Formiga has made such big improvements. But J Joe B's striking is still very, very good. You know, you saw that in the fight against Dustin Ortiz. He was dropping Dustin Ortiz with a, a left hand in that fight. His low calf kick looked very good. Even his grappling, you know, he, he that that fight against Ortiz was a dog fight. It was a back and forth. Uh, you know, you know, one guy taking the back, the other guy taking the back, getting mount. It was a back and forth, uh, grand, grinding, scrambly type of fight. You know, that's the the hardest type of fight really in MMA. It's just straight grappling just straight cardio and will um, for the full 15 minutes. And that was, you know, an incredible fight that jo jo uh, Joe P was able to win two rounds to one. And, you know, Formiga really just dominated Figueroa three rounds to zero in that, that last fight. Just a very, very impressive victory from Formiga, proving that he's, uh, you know, these two guys are the, the, the best two flyweights in the world. You know, who knows what uh, Henry Cejudo is doing nowadays, um, you know, or with, the, you know, obviously he just beat Marlon Marais, but who knows if he'll fl fight at 125 pounds again. So, you know, we, this might be uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, unofficial UFC flyweight title fight, you know, for, you know, a unification bout, if you will, even though it's just a three round fight. So I expect this one to be really close. I honestly expect it to be a 50 50 type of fight because uh, Benavides has great takedowns. He's got great timing on his takedowns, but Ortiz was able to take him down. Ortiz was able to take his back. You know, Formiga's got incredible back takes, incredible ground control. If, if Ortiz or if, Formiga is in the same spots that Ortiz was in that fight. I expect Formiga to take uh, advantage uh, much better than Ortiz was able to, you know, keeping that top control, keeping that back, you know, looking for a submission. I don't think that Benavidez will get submitted. If Benavidez loses this fight, I think that he will just be out grappled, you know, two rounds to one. He'll just, Formiga will be a step ahead in the grappling. Uh, if Benavidez wins this fight, then I think that he will uh, stuff the takedowns or scramble on top and just outstrike Formiga on the feet. So it really depends on where this fight plays out. If the fight's on the feet for the most of the time, I see Benavidez winning. If the fight's on the ground most of the time, I see Formiga winning. So yeah, it's uh, really a 50-50 type of fight. And in that case, with Formiga being a plus 145 underdog, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna side with the value being on Formiga. But honestly, I think that Benavidez wins this fight, man. I still think he's sharp. I still think his striking is real crisp. His power in his hands is good. His grappling has always been phenomenal. His wrestling uh, is solid. I think that uh, you know both of these guys are, are two of the most well-rounded mixed martial arts fighters in all of MMA. It doesn't matter.
matter that they're you know the t not in the top 15 pound for pound i'm telling you these two guys are two of the best well-rounded fighters in mma and to see these guys go at it on saturday night it's going to be a pleasure i wish this this fight got to be five rounds but you know so be it um so the the value is going to be on formiga in this one i can't trust benavidez at that that price uh at this point in his career with you know how good formiga is looking lately so for me the, uh, the values on formiga uh, i'm gonna pick benavidez to win so now we're going to move on to the main event of the evening in the heavyweight division we got junior dos santos who is 21 and 5 taking on francis Ngano, who is 13 and 3 the opening betting line for this fight was francis Ngano minus 230 junior dos santos plus 170 right now we are seeing uh Ngano minus 245 dos santos plus 205 so two-way action coming in on this fight you know uh i'd say i'd say more action on nagano's way and you know people just trust in that power of nagano you know um the the blueprint is written on uh nagano i i uh, it's funny because I, I write notes for all these fights right and i wrote down nagano i write i wrote bad cardio bad takedown defense bad jiu-jitsu great power good boxing and I, you know, I was, I, I said, you know what, let me check my notes and see if I have any more notes on uh, Nagano that I could add. So I scroll back up to the Nagano versus Velasquez notes. And what do I have written down is the exact five things I wrote down. Bad cardio, bad takedown defense, bad jujitsu, great power, good boxing. So, you know, you know what you're getting from Nagano. He's just a straight powerhouse in the feet, throwing absolute bombs. Uh, you know, Junior Dos Santos, obviously the more well-rounded martial artist. Dude's been been at it for a lot longer. Has fought and beaten the better competition. You know, former heavyweight champion. He's been around the block, and he's taken out two uh, you know power strikers in a row. Tai Tuivasa, a powerful boxer, and uh, I guess you could call Derek Lewis a powerful boxer as well. Um, but you know, he he was attacking the lead leg of Derek Lewis. You know, with that low calf kick. Uh, and then uh, hit him with a spinning back kick, hurt him to the body real bad, and then eventually finished him with the, uh, some some right hand. His right hand was money in that fight. He rocked Lewis a few times with the overhand right. But uh, you know what worried me in that fight with Dos Santos is, is is he would he was still swinging wild, man. He was he was not fighting smart. You know he can fight very very smart. He can fight for 25 minutes. He can uh, pace himself with good cardio, good footwork, fight behind the jab like he did versus Blagoy Ivanov, but. He also can, can brawl a little bit. You know, if Dos Santos wants to trade in the pocket, uh, you know, he will do so. And he, he uh, you know, he got some, he had some close calls versus Lewis there. You know, Lewis, you know, clipped him with a few punches. And Dos Santos was open to be countered a few times. And that's honestly where I think is, is going to be his fatal flaw in this one. I think that, um, you know, I don't see Dos Santos doing that thing where he where he fights for the 25 minutes, where he circles, where he jabs, where he stays at distance and, you know, uh, uses his footwork. I don't think he can do that versus Nagano, man. I think Nagano is just going to blitz him. He's going to start throwing power strikes, and, and Dos Santos is just going to be forced to engage. So if Dos Santos tries to you know, uh, to keep this fight at range and to circle and use footwork, I see him getting knocked out, um, you know, to, with a, you know, a, a big overhand from Nagano. Um, but if Dos Santos comes out here and is ready to trade right away, I think that's his best chance of winning. I think he could touch the chin of Nagano with that overhand right or, you know, start uh, hitting him with some, uh, some calf kicks, some spinning back kicks, you know, taking the gas out of uh, Nagano, taking the legs away from him, and then, uh, you know, maybe uh, finish him with the, the hands later in the fight that's uh, dos santos's best chance but how i see the fight going down i see dos santos uh you know touching nagano with a punch but i think that dos santos will get a little too uh, you know uh overzealous i think that he won't be um calculated i don't think that he will uh you know I don't think that he will, you know, fight smart, and he I don't think he'll chase that finish in a very, uh, you know, calculated way. And I think that he will get countered with a big punch from uh, Nagano, and he will get put out. So, um, I I do think that Dos Santos has a chance to win this fight. Obviously, I think he can attack that lead leg early, take the legs away from Nagano, and then outbox uh, uh, Nagano. You know, use the, I think the kicks are are big pivotal for for Dos Santos. If he if he uses the kicks effectively, I think that he could beat uh, Nagano here. Um, I don't see this one going the distance. I don't really see it getting out of the second round, honestly. Um, 
you know, it could be, it could last uh, until the second, but I, I'd see it ended in the first, honestly, you know, it's kind of cliche, it's heavyweight, um, it's, you know, two big, powerful punchers, but, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes, the, this, this is a, a matchup where the two powerful boxers, you know, these guys are, are bound to collide, uh, you know, one guy is bound to eat a powerful shot, and someone is probably going to get dropped at some point in this fight, so I see the way it going down is uh, Dos Santos hits uh, Nagano with a punch, we think that uh, Dos Santos is about to finish Nagano, but then Nagano comes back with a you know a powerful punch of his own and puts Dos Santos out. Um, so we got a, a great card going down this Saturday night in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Thirteen fights; they were all going down on ESPN. And with that being said, we're just going to quickly recap the UFC uh, Korean Zombie versus Hinato Moiscano card that went down this past weekend. And I mean quickly because it is three a.m. in the uh, three a.m. right now. And uh, Darren Wynn outboxed Eric Spicely uh, to a decision, you know, crazy back and forth type of fight. That was a real good one. Molly McCann, my girl. Molly McCann has been my favorite fighter all week. She came through for me big. I, pr- I picked her to win last week. I picked, uh, you know, her to plus, plus three and a half points, her decision line. You know, I made some coin on Molly McCann and, uh, you know, it was an impressive victory from her. Uh Rosenstruck dropped Crowder with the jab and finished him with some uh, some ground and pound shortly after a very mean fight there. Luis Payne getting that finish over Matt Wyman over after putting a beating on him for a, a long, long time. That was an ugly, ugly beating that Payne put on Matt Wyman. Ashley Yoder dominating Shiri Kondo bell to bell, taking her down, taking her back, just absolutely dominating her. 30-24 um, decision for Ashley Yoder. Dan Ige, you know, straight pulling out that victory uh you know it was a close back and forth type of fight Ige rocked Aguilar in round one round one round one for Ige Aguilar came back and started to win round two and then in round three Ige was just a fresher fighter and you know outworked Kevin Aguilar to a decision very impressive decision victory from uh, Dan Ige Kevin Holland uh, defeated uh, Alessio De Kirko by decision. I disagree with this decision. I thought Alessio De Kirko honestly won all three rounds. Um, so I have no idea how they gave that one to Holland. It was, you know, a razor close fight. Yeah, I, all three rounds were close. I I, th- I know how they gave it to Holland. I just disagree with it. I think that it should have gone the other way to De Kirko. Andrew Lee, you know, just one step ahead of Montana De La Rosa on the feet and on the ground in this one. Just an outclass, an outclassing performance from her. Don't really remember too much about the fight. I think I was, uh, you know, making dinner during this fight, so I got to go back and rewatch that one. Same with uh, Yule versus Dos Santos. I think I, I was finishing up cooking a steak during this fight, and I didn't get to catch it. But uh, Yule, uh, you know, was just outstriking Dos Santos the whole fight. It was a, it was a, a wild back and forth type of fight, though. They, they were trading. They, these guys were, you know, throwing some very, very fast strikes in, in that octagon. But Dos Santos could not get the fight to the floor, and Yule outstruck him to a decision. Randy Brown, huge improvements from last fight coming in here and finishing Brian Barberino with the strikes. Randy Brown really started to find his, his rhythm. You know, he's outstriking Barberino and eventually finished him. He was murdering that body of Barberino and eventually finished him with a, 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 some knees and punches in round three of that fight. Inc- impressive performance from Randy Brown. And in the main event, Hanato Moiscano came out kind of slow, was throwing some lazy jabs versus Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie. Jung slipped outside the jab, threw a massive overhand right, floored Moicano, rocked him bad, and finished him up with some ground and pound for the TKO victory. Only 58 seconds into this fight, so uh, Moicano started slow. Very disappointing performance from him. Zombie seized the moment. Beautiful counterpunch. Great, great power. And, um, you know, great victory from Chan Sung Jung in that victory in that fight. So, uh, you know, that's going to be all for the podcast this week. It's been episode uh, 65. You know, sorry if this episode is a little low energy. Like I said, I started recording at, at 2 in the morning and I finished at 3, three in the morning. So um, that's the reason why, you know, a little less energy this episode. But still uh, breezed through all the fights, you know, did some good analysis for this uh, this fight card. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed the episode and I hope you all enjoy the fight Saturday night. And I will catch you next week before International Fight Week, UFC 239. Peace.